What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the season finale of Side Hustle. And on this episode, we're going to sit down with Dexter Henry. He is the CEO and founder of Backpack Broadcasting, a national weather reporter at AccuWeather, and co host of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast with me. But on this episode, it's not going to be a podcast. We're going to sit down and talk about a lot of things that we haven't discussed on the podcast, like how he's impacted the lives and careers of many other people, how fatherhood has impacted his career and life, and some more things on this episode of Side Hustle. backpack broadcasting t-shirt let's start there because that's pretty much where a lot of this started for you <laughs> just sort of yeah. what, what were some of the early days of backpack broadcasting what did that look like and what was going on in your life that made you want to sort of create this yeah the early days of backpack broadcasting back in 2010 you know I, I was working a job and I wanted opportunities to be on camera and that job wasn't giving me the opportunities that I thought I needed to be on camera. I wasn't seeing people like me and this company be on camera. In fact, it seems like they kept hiring the same kinds mm. of people. It didn't seem like there was a seat for me at the table, so I decided to have to create my own seat. And that idea kind of had been put in my mind by my mentor, Jamoke Davis. He kind of was always telling me, you need to start your own thing. You need to do uh, this form of backpack journalism. And then my cousin, my little cousin, Makeda Paul, she had kind of been saying the same thing too. Mm. So. I always had this seed in my mind of wanting to do it. And then, you know, I was getting frustrated by not getting these opportunities. And one day I finally came home and hit my cousin up and I said, hey, like, let's do it. And so we decided to come up with a name. And I wanted something with backpack journalism in the name. And she said, backpack broadcasting. And that mm. was back on November 2nd, 2010. And it just stuck from there. You know, I liked that name. I decided to go out and do it. And so I had opportunities with uh, covering local teams here in New York, professional teams, Jets, Giants, Knicks, Nets, uh, Yankees, Mets. And so, I was going to these games already doing work and I would spend extra time shooting extra stuff, keeping extra sound, extra B-roll, and doing like recap reports I was putting out on my own. And the company I was working for, you know, as that started to grow, it was one funny thing I'll never forget. They, they asked me, they sent me the link and they was like, what is this? And me being like, oh. I me, me being like how I am, some people may call me being an asshole or whatever, but I was just like, <laughs> Well, this is a production company that I started <laughs> that is doing blah, blah, blah. Like, I literally explained it to someone. In that voice? No, I, I just was via email. You know, I didn't care. And so they tried to tell me I couldn't do this anymore. And this was a real situation. I had a situation where they were like, either you can do this and not work here, or you can stop doing this and still work here. And I chose oh. the money to still work there. But you can't stop. You can't stop me. Nothing will ever stop me. That's one of the things I took out of that experience is you're not going to be able to stop me. So... Um, I just decided to shift my focus elsewhere. And I started covering high school sports, high school basketball, primarily in the New York City area. They told me I couldn't do stuff professionally, which was like through my access to the company, but it's, they couldn't stop me from doing that. Yeah. When I started doing that, they tried to stop me and tell me I couldn't use their equipment, yeah. which is really interesting about how people try to stop you. Recently seen this with Rich Paul, but as minorities, we've always overcome this and we do it. And this is what I did. I overcame it. I kept doing my own thing. I got my own equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't stop me from doing it. So that was the genesis in the early days. It really came out of just wanting reps to be able to be seen on camera and people to see my talent. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I know it worked because it worked in getting me opportunities with the News 12 networks. People did see my talent. So no matter how much they tried to stop me or that company didn't want to be as progressive as they could have been and they wanted to you know, keep things for whites only, that was problematic. But I ended up forging a way through and it was really all by starting my own thing. Who was the company? Uh, they, 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 they're not worth mentioning, <laughs> mentioning. I don't even think they do anything anymore, but I don't think they're even worth mentioning in that realm. You know, like they have to live with the decisions they made and I'm glad with the decisions I made. I know that sounds very corporate and diplomatic, but <laughs> like... I, I, and unlike you? <laughs> no, nah, I tell the story because the story's important, I think, for people to know, but I don't mention their name because yeah. it's not worth mentioning. But a lot of people go through some of those early hurdles where, uh, you know, we, we've talked about this before where if you're doing a lot of stuff, maybe that can be a hindrance to you. And you used yeah. to think that way, that being one of the examples. But then as you progress, it wasn't. And how so? Yeah, that was a company where you thought like, hey, me doing something on the side, they're not really respecting it. Companies are really not going to like it. But that's really not how it was. You know, going forward, uh, other companies I worked for, other places that ended up hiring me, it seemed like anything I did with Backpack became a benefit. 
um, to me being hiring there. Even my current job as a national weather reporter for AccuWeather, the person who hired me really liked the work I did with backpack broadcasting even more than some of my stuff in News 12. They liked the creativity. So I think when you show what you can do to other people, you know, there isn't one way for anything in broadcast media or journalism. There's many different ways you can get to where you want to go. And it just really depends on you catching the eye of certain people and them seeing your talent and what you do. All you need is somebody to believe in you and an opportunity, mm. but I think it all starts with you believing in yourself. Mm. And I think that was tough at first to understand, especially what I went through with that company that suppressed me and my opportunities. Mm. But I think going forward, I had that confidence in myself and what I was doing and what I was building, and I saw positivity from it. So if you saw how people were following me doing high school basketball coverage, I saw people from News 12 see that I could do stuff and report on camera and give me opportunities. And shout out to those people and those companies that deserve to be mentioned because they did realize the talent and help with those opportunities. But it really started out with me doing my own thing. That's kind of what caught the eye of them. How hard was it to, I guess, build connections with maybe some of these sports teams and things of that nature when you're going in there mm -hmm. and you're not going there with maybe ESPN or the New York Post or whatever it is, you're going there with Backpack Broadcasting. And this is in the early days. This isn't now where Backpack Broadcasting is more established and you can get into a lot of these places. I had done stuff for a while where I built that cachet and relationships with those people. So when I told them I was doing my independent stuff, it wasn't that really that hard. And then, mm -hmm. you know, another company, I'll give a shout out to the Brooklyn Nets because when they were in New Jersey and I started covering them through Backpack stuff, they gave me the opportunities when they came to Brooklyn mm -hmm. to cover different events and be able to get credentialed. And they saw the work that I did and how people followed them. So I think relationships take time, building those things take time. But the biggest relationships I made was, you know, when I did stuff in the high school basketball world, because that really was more community. That was really how I grew more relationships and grew my reach. And, you know, coaches like Tiny Moore and legendary coach here in New York, Ruth Lovelace, they really helped me and gave me access to their teams, their players that other people weren't getting. And so, you know, those relationships, which are great till today, you know, it wasn't hard. You guys just got to ask, man. Like, that's kind of <laughs> more of the thing. It's like, you can't be afraid. And I, I was talking to a young person about this the other day, hmm. not being afraid to go into these schools and or ask people. You got to ask, you know, to whom much is given, you know, much is required. If you ask, you shall receive. Yeah. You're not just going to get in and start covering Warriors, Nets, or Warriors, Knicks at the right. Garden. You know, those things are going to take time. But I think if you believe in what you're doing and put out quality, people will see that. And that's the, the content aspect of it. And we're going to get some more of that because, you know, you've also branched off into sideline stories. We got the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast and stuff like that. But yeah. first, just the business aspect of backpack broadcasting early on because you go in and you find this project and things yeah. like that. But Business. How much of that did you know going in? You know, did you did you did you even go into it with the mentality of maybe one day this can make some money, or was it always just sort of a labor of love type of deal? I didn't know anything, yeah, at all whatsoever. Like I didn't know anything about the business, how to pump my content, how to really push it. I learned that as I went along, so I went in very blind. I knew certain things about making content and reporting, but the business aspect I really took time to learn. You know, there came a time where we were streaming games, and I didn't know like. What would somebody pay for that? How do I get into the game of that? Um, that was another thing I took a leap on. Mm. I actually literally quit a job, a full-time job uh -huh. that wasn't serving me at the time because I had the opportunity to stream some games with the uh, City University of New York, a conference, and just jumped out on the limb and did that through Backpack. And I knew how to stream the games, that I had learned it, but I definitely figured it out in, you know, in, in doing that. So there's things you learn along the way and you got to figure out how to do. But I think that's anything with any business. That's the thing about a startup or doing it. You get to figure those things out on your own and there's beauty in that. And just sort of branching off, like I mentioned, and then creating these other things. Yeah. Like what has that sort of given you? Because now it's not just backpack broadcasting as a whole. It's right. like the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast you find that through there on YouTube. And then there's also the sports walk and then there's also sideline stories. So I guess the importance of all of that, the inspiration for all of that and being able to not also just be in front of the camera, but be behind it in this yeah. executive producer role as well, because you've also, and we're gonna talk about this one day, have a serious conversation about this, but you've developed and are directly responsible for a lot of talent oh, man. Uh, that's but, come through New York City recently. Well, well, I wanna start with that just for one second and say, because for me, I wanted it to be that. If you look at the early stuff on my website, I said I wanted the opportunities to be able to help other talent grow. I wanted to be able to give platforms, especially for women, people of color. To, and I'm very proud. That's probably one of the things I'm most proud of that I've been able to do um, is help people and that give other people a voice. So that's definitely something I always wanted to do, beside outside of myself. 
to go to the things that it's grown into, you know, I think you change, you evolve as you get older. You know, when I started it and I was uh, 25, I wanted to just um, put myself out there. But then I thought about content I like to do and how I like to tell stories. And I was always loved long form journalism. So I love HBO Real Sports, E60. I love documentaries, I love watching that stuff. And that's kind of, I started wanting to do sideline stories. The Sports Walk was from an idea with a, uh, I saw from another director filmmaker, Cecilia Meke, who was British and she did this thing with minorities, people of color, going through their cities, walking around, talking about issues, mostly in politics and socioeconomic. And I said, man, what if somebody did that with sports? Mm. I kind of took from that and took certain things from that and tweaked it my own way and did it with the sports walk. And you were in the second episode mm -hmm. and it was for people to have a voice to talk about things in sports in a more nuanced way than you may get on Twitter or something else. And so yeah. that's what I tried to do and make sure we had people of all backgrounds talking about sports in that way. So those were just ideas and I don't know what's next, but I, I wanted to create things differently than what you normally saw out there. And to some degree, people see sideline stories, but the difference with that was I kind of wanted to put my feel on it with different music and more of a hip hop style with it into what you were doing, or I should say more cultural style. So that's kind of what I did. But yeah, man, that's the growth. You grow as a person, you grow in what you want to create. You don't have to stay the same. I never wanted to stay the same. So. You know, I just always want to create new stuff that's that's dope that people can actually resonate with. And as all this is going on, just what were some of the things that you were balancing early on? Because you're trying to build backpack broadcasting yeah. as, I guess, your side hustle, if you want to call yeah. it that. But you're trying to build that up. But then you have all these other real jobs. And you've some, you're one of these people that you've worked at like 30 different places. Yeah. And that's probably not an exaggerated number. You've probably legitimately worked at like 30 uh, different places. We're getting close. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's, that's the Caribbean in me, I guess, right? Like just, just that hustle mentality of having multiple different jobs. I think early on, it was balancing the time, like especially freelancing, was some days I was going to New Jersey, covering football, Giants and Jets, and coming back to New York and trying to make a 4.30 or 5 o'clock uh, public school athletic league basketball game. Yeah. And then turning that around and editing it. It was a long day. And then getting up maybe the next day and doing the same thing and being yeah. like, man, I'm tired. But the rewarding feeling at the end of it was so good and creating your own stuff and putting it out and seeing how people would react to it. You know, not knowing at first the challenge of like how people would react to it. Cause that's really the hard thing when you're first creating something is like, anybody who creates something I give a lot of respect to because you're jumping. You're putting your stuff out there. You're putting your art out there. You don't know how people are gonna take it. Yep. And you're just seeing what happens. And you don't know how that's gonna go all the time, but you're just seeing what goes on and what can be done. But um, just balancing the time. The time at first was the biggest, biggest challenge. And once I think I learned how to balance that and saw the rewards of it and saw how it was helping me in my career, you don't worry about it as much. You just create. So in 2016, you have a kid. Yep. Uh, change your life forever. Yeah, kids change your life forever. <laughs> Absolutely. So but, yeah. just how does, just, but how, I don't think enough people understand and I don't really understand it. I understand it a little bit more now just from an offhand sort of perspective, yeah, but right. no one's really, really going to truly understand just the impact that has on you personally and professionally, Yeah, you know, just as an adult. So how does that sort of affect you as you're, you know, you have the work ethic that you mm -hmm. have, but now you have to sort of be smarter about your time, so to speak. Yeah, you have to. I, I think it impacts you from the, the time you find as a man, you find out that you're going to be a father. You know, I've told you the promenade story. <laughs> <laughs> you know that story. So y'all can find out. Not, no, 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 but but you know, I found the day I found out um, I was going to be a father. You know, it was a lot to take in. I was like, man. Yeah. You know, you, you're not doubting yourself. You think about what you have to do, how you're going to do it, what you want to do. Um, I think if you're a good man and wants to provide for their child, good parent, anybody who wants to do that, mm -hmm. it was just a lot to take in. I live in Brooklyn. I had to go to the Brooklyn Promenade where I found out at work, and I went and had to just sit and collect my thoughts and get this together and be like, man, I'm gonna be a father. So it was a lot, Yeah. but um, it changes. It's hard at first when you have a very young baby and there's a lot of time and attention you need. And, and now my daughter's three years old and there's a little bit more the way you divert your time, but you do, it is harder to, I don't say harder, I don't like using that word, challenging, challenging to yeah. hustle around different things within what you're doing. However, I think there's this really positive thing out of it in which that it really, pushes you further like it gives you another push a gear in your hustle game you know i want to do more for my daughter i want to show my daughter more of the independence the creating controlling your own thing not having to depend on anybody mm. um i always said to so i said this to a friend years ago before 
you know, my daughter was ever born. I said, the most important thing I will do is to raise a black woman in this country. Mm. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to be able to do that, you know, with, with, with my daughter and try to show her the things I think that are right so that she's empowered to be as great as she can be. You know, I look back, it was an exciting time. You were nervous a little bit. Mm. And I still find it exciting. I just try to enjoy every day of it. But it's a challenge to, you know, balance your work, my full-time job, my, you know, side hustles, part-time, anything else I do with that. It is challenging. But you know what? If you want to get something done, you got to get it done. So I figure it out and figure out how to make it work. Um, and I think if you have good supportive people around you that help you in doing that stuff, it can work. So I'm fortunate to have that. And, uh, you know, it's a challenge, but I, I, enjoy the, I enjoy the journey every day. You trying to make her become an athlete or... I mean, Simone could I do. See, I see my basketball daughter, hoops my here. Daughter, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, got a, I got a basketball hoop for my daughter. You know, I, she plays with so many different things. She can do whatever she wants to do. Like, she watches sports with me, so it's dope because, oh. you know, she recognizes, you know, she knows the Knicks logo. She knows oh. the Nets logo. She knows the Jets logo. I don't know that's about probably, that. That's <laughs> probably not good because <laughs> she's going to get the pain that I have as a fan. But she recognizes it, so she knows if I put on Knicks games, she's, you know, Knicks, you know, for she's Knicks and, you know, the Mets. So she, she like, sees that stuff. But, you know, I try to make her also watch, you know, I'm trying to, now she's young, so I try to make her see a lot of Serena Williams now, mm. you know, before Serena retires. Yeah. The other night we were looking at some of Simone Biles, uh -huh. um, you know, on the TV. So seeing these strong women athletes, WNBA games we watch too. So w watch having her around sports. If that's something she likes, she gravitates to, that's dope. If she doesn't, as long, you know, she's going to be great in whatever she wants to do. And just last thing for me, I know this is hard to project, especially since things are always changing, yeah. but next three to five years, what do you sort of see as it relates to backpack, broadcasting, the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, your work yeah. at AccuWeather and at other places, sideline stories and things of that nature? I mean, the way I look at it, the next three to five years, it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to be doing great stuff. Backpack's going to be doing great stuff. That's always my mindset. There's always progress going forward. You know, I'd like to see our content expand, do more things with the podcast. You know, in almost two years, we've already had a fantastic array of guests that we've been able to do independently yeah. and do some of the things that we see bigger podcast studios and people with bigger backings behind them get. So when I see that in two years, to me, the sky's only the limit. Some of the stories I've been able to do for Sideline Stories, whether it was a Kaepernick piece or La Cultura we did, um, I, I think being able to do those things or the sports walk, the things I see is being able to connect with more communities, especially people of color in terms of the sports media landscape. I see it growing in that. It's already grown to a certain point, but I think if I do that, that's just going to help the business and me personally as a content creator and reporter grow even more. So that's where I see the company and those things going in the next three to five years. The real thing about media and what you can do is it's about how you connect with people. And if you're able to connect with people in this meaningful way that's mm -hmm. authentic, I think you're going to be fine as a media outlet. You know, and I think the other thing I see you doing is collaborating with more people in doing things, especially people of color. Yeah. Um, I think there's strength in numbers for us. I think there's more ways we can see, you know, the Asian community, the black community, Latino communities in, in sports journalism be a unit together, do things together in a really meaningful way. And I think that that will continue. And I plan to be at the forefront of that. So as long as that's keep going and we keep doing that, we're going to be all right. We're the Kendrick. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're we going to be, be all right. right. Hey. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this week's episode of Side Hustle. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dexter Henry. And that's all for this season of Side Hustle. But we will be back pretty soon with some bonus content and some things you can look forward to before the year is over. Make sure you go back and catch some episodes that you missed. But until then, thank you for watching Side Hustle Season 1.